Welcome to our self-inflicted adventure. What seems like a lifetime ago, we left Australia, intending to sail our way around the world. It's been a roller coaster since then, and while the plan has changed many times, we've been laughing our way through and learned a new lesson for every step of the way. And between us, the real adventure has only just begun. Hello everybody. Uh, now last month we released an episode with six top tips that we had for new boat owners and cruisers. Um, and it received a really, really awesome response, which is fantastic. Um, what you might not have known though, is actually we filmed 10. And we filmed and edited 10, but we only released a few because we like to keep things short and sweet, have everyone's attention span on point, and kind of keep it below the 30 minute mark. So having said all that, these are the best of the rest and some tips which we hope that you'll get some value out of. Check your tides and doubt your charts. We were still at the marina that we'd bought the boat in and we'd been boat owners for officially a month. We were all the way at the end of this canal system um, in a marina. It was about a two hour motor from where we were in the marina to go to this lock system. And you had to go through these canals and it was really brackish water and there were alligators would come and visit the boat looking for scraps all the time. So when we finally decided to actually leave that marina and untie ourselves from the dock, we were so excited, like ridiculously excited. Everything was going great. I was like, this is awesome. We're off, it's happening. And I remember backing off the jetty the first time and, and sort of that, that was the first time I'd ever, ever driven the boat, period. It was seven to eight feet of water the whole way. We were a little bit iffy about how much water we draw because we you know, we draw six feet. We were probably about halfway down the down the canal system, doing about four knots maybe in about seven feet of water. It's a it's a dredged channel. The charts must be right. Bang! We just had the first of our and what I hope will be the last <laughs> run grounds, and it was a hell of a bump. Kara was on the wheel holding on. And I remember like she sort of lurched forward over the wheel and I, I clipped it and fell past it. We hit something so hard. So we've just jumped in to the tropical clear blue waters of uh, the Bahamas <coughs> only to discover that we've got about a three inch chunk out of the front of our keel that I suspect happened on our way out of the lock that we bought uh, the boat in. To this day, I don't know what it was. Um, but it really, really put a fright in us, that first mile down the road. Anyway, we, we carried on, everything was fine, and we get to this lock. Okay, sweet. Wait for our turn. Drive into the lock. And we shut the gates, and we open back up again. We went about 10 feet and well and truly ran aground in about four feet of water. There was no possible way that we were ever going to get through that amount of mud and silt. Very awkwardly backed out of the lock. We checked the tide later that night to discover that foolishly we tried to drive through of like the lowest of low tide that day. The next morning we tried again at what was the high tide of that day. It was probably equally as bad. And this time we got stuck in about four and a half feet of mud. I'm still not convinced the boat wasn't just built here. We've decided to wait for last light, which is not great, uh, for the highest tide of the day. Nine o'clock came around. We got there and we opened up the lock system. The boat came out of the lock. And even still, even still, we had to just plow through five and a half feet of mud. Whoa. And we finally started to see like seven feet and seven and a half feet and both of us were just so excited. Yay! First and biggest lesson that we learned on day one. To not trust the charts and to check the tides. You can choose a time and a place, never both. So straight off the bat we learnt this lesson. Never before have I heard a saying that more accurately represents what it's like trying to plan your life for meeting a guest or being at a certain place at a certain time on a sailboat than that. And since the day we left uh, the US, we have pretty much embodied that saying. Guests more accurately represent this saying because um, it's happened to us a few times. We were going to depart St. Martin. 
thought at the time that we'd be able to get to our meeting place. We got as far as Guadalupe and we discovered a massive oil leak. So we are just pulling into a rainy day in Guadalupe. Yeah, real problem now. Are you kidding me? Well, the drip pan is full of oil, so hopefully we've just left a cap off or something, but we're not going anywhere today. If not, I don't know if we're going anywhere for a while. That's the problem. We got lucky that we didn't blow the engine, to be honest with you, but we were stuck on the western side of Guadalupe, which is kind of a beautiful place, but there's not much there. Uh, how about bus trip to Pontepia, Pontepito? Did not go so well. We waited 45 minutes at the bus stop, who then took us one kilometre down the road and told us to get off and wait for another bus. We then waited an hour and a half for that bus stop for another bus, which never came. Who knows, we might have still been waiting there or he might have, or maybe some bus might have magically appeared. But we decided to cut our losses. Try to find another way to get these parts or to get out to Ponta. Peter Piper picked a bunch of pickles. <sighs> Um, it then took us a further week in order to order in a new part, get the new part sent to us from America and get the oil leak fixed. In that time, Chiara's mother and sister had flown into Grenada and were twiddling their thumbs waiting for us because we told them we'll meet you in Grenada. And we finally met in Beckway about a week and a half, maybe two weeks after they had arrived. Just to add insult to injury, we blew out our mainsail coming into uh, in, into Bequay, so we we couldn't we were delayed in Bequay for a week as well. That just really ramps home the point that you can choose a time, you can choose a place, never both. You can have your guests meet you wherever you might be when they decide to come, or you can agree on a place and they meet you there, but you have to go ASAP. You go straight there and you wait for them. You know, as a captain, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in charge. I'm in charge of the schedule. But really, I think we can all agree the boat's in charge. The boat says what goes and what doesn't. This was one of our earliest screw-ups, and it was kind of, actually, we've never spoken about this on camera. It didn't make the final cut. I guess we were too embarrassed in hindsight. When we set off from Turks and Caicos. We just left Turks and Caicos on our way to... Where are we going? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. We were supposed to have an easterly breeze, so we were going to run southeast across to Dominican Republic and then tack our way up the coast um, on the way to Puerto Rico. And we were going to tack further up to San Juan because uh, we're on a bit of a schedule, so we, we want to keep hit a few hot spots in uh, Puerto Rico and then carry on south. We had plans to go to Puerto Rico. We thought it would be a great stop to go on to on our way further south. So we had flown in to the States. And you, when you do that, we get what we get what's called an ESTA visa, which I think is 90, it is 90 days. Uh, and you get it online and then you present it at the airport and you're allowed in, that's your visa. We then bought a boat, sailed from the States to Turks and Caicos. Then we re-arrived in Puerto Rico and needed to go back into the US, which is where the problem arose because we re-entered the US uh, on a sailboat. Close to Puerto Rico, we experienced a squall, um, and it was in Mona Passage. Um, we were so spun around with this squall and rain, wind coming from every direction that we just didn't know where we were going. So we turned our motor on. We noticed that the boat actually wasn't going anywhere. Um, and this was the first time that we uh, had experienced the prop shaft falling off. So, we're about 20 miles from Mayaguez in Puerto Rico, and I'm I'm in disbelief that this has happened. This is an absolute disaster and we're actually in a bit of trouble here. Uh, somehow, our drive shaft has detached from the engine. It hasn't necessarily broken, I just think it, it's just let go. And now it's pulled itself all the way back and is stuck in the packing gland. And it's just wedged in there so tight that I can't free it up. And even if I could, at the moment, I'm worried that if I did, water's just going to come pouring in the now what I assume is now smashed up packing gland. Yeah, we're in we're in a bit of in a bit of trouble here. Show up to the customs office, exhausted but happy to be on dry land again. Try to check in. We hand hit. You know, he's like, oh, what? You know, can I have your visa? Can I have this? Give him the Esther visa. His face just like like deadpan. He's like, what is that? He asked me again, where are where are our visas? And I pointed to our Esther visas. And then he, he informed me that actually, Esther visas aren't valid if you are sailing into American territories. You've arrived 
illegally. Uh, and I said, oh, okay, can we get one? No. Well, what, what do you mean? He's like, well, you've arrived illegally. I have to, I, you've got two options. Number one was to get a fine for enter, entering illegally into American waters. And the fine was absurd. It was like $3,000 or something. Our second option was to um, apply for a humanitarian visa, given that we had just kind of crash landed. Can I just leave? One, you know, I'll, fix my, I'll fix my problems and I'll leave. It was like I was never here. He's like, no, I can't let you go now. You've arrived illegally. <sighs> Anyway, the guy actually was really nice. We explained the situation to him. And as it turns out, the problems that we had kind of gave us an opening to get said humanitarian visa. Got this visa, we ended up, it was, everything was fine. Right, shaft reattached, spinning. We are moving forward, we are off anchor. The Millennial Falcon flies again. <laughs> but if you go and look on, on well, Google, anywhere. You need a B1, a B2 visa. And we just, I guess we were just novices. We didn't think to look. And and I suppose in a way we had, we thought we had a visa. Who's to know that flying in and sailing in is not the same thing? We know now, and you know now, but had we have checked the sailing entry requirements, it would have been pa painfully obvious. I am a massive fan of this saying. And I don't know whether it's a common saying or whether we just made it up. Yeah, boats and people definitely rot in harbour, particularly me. Boats need to be ready to go at a moment's notice, even if you're not going anywhere, because it's a mental thing. And like, I'm happiest when the boat is buttoned up, ready to sail at a moment's notice. Stopping is unavoidable, but you, you can move more often than I, I think perhaps we have in the past. Most recently, with COVID being around, we've had to sit at anchor in Grenada for a very long time. During that whole time, we have definitely not felt like our usual selves. We have been a little deflated, bogged down with either doing boat work or distracting ourselves from our sailing mission. The downside of that is that you, the longer you stay, the more the boat becomes into, descends into a state of disorganization. And before you know it, you, you feel like you've got lead boots on and you just can't go anywhere. And the longer you leave it, the less confident you are when it comes time to leave. Your faith is a little compromised when you're at anchor for a long time. Whereas if you go sailing once every few days, you're like, well, I, I hauled anchor yesterday or the day before. And then I put a hook in last night and nothing went wrong and nothing's going to go wrong today and you just more comp you get momentum meanwhile millie our boat has been also been sitting at anchor and she's not been happy that she's not been sailing either the anchor chain rotted the paint was just gone like it was like we never did the job the the cutlass bearing was just full of calcification all the the zinc just ate itself to pieces fast forward a couple of months uh hurricane gorgonzola came through and uh, we hauled out as a precaution and did another paint job because, as I said, the last one was just trashed. Uh, fast forward three months, we've been hopping along every week or so, just trying to keep on the move. It's like she just splashed yesterday. It's like the boat splashed yesterday. Boats love to move. Boats were not built to sit in harbours or at anchor or on stilts in a yard. They were built to smash through the water to get a, you know, the water cleans the hull for you. If you put some turns through your cutlass bearing or your stuffing box, it's, a, it's infinitely better for it. Even just the motor itself, just put it, you know, put some turns on the motor, give it a half an hour with some revs once a week just to get, stop all the gunk building up, get some fresh water coming through it. There's just no, there's no substitute. If you leave a boat to sit, it will rot. So everyone, thank you for watching and I hope that you got some value from some of the lessons that we've learned so far. Um, if you liked it, then uh, click the thumbs up button and think about subscribing. And thank you very much. We will see you next week.